Hello, everybody, everybody, and welcome to this episode of uh, Open Source in Business. It's a, a webcast series that delves into some of the lesser understood and lesser spoken about aspects of, of the business of open source. And we've had, uh, this is our eighth episode, and we've had a number of uh, topics that we've talked about that have that have really delved into uh, some, of the, some, of, some of the things I think that um, um, could really use a lot more attention. Things like, how do you get a job in open source? Or how do you uh, bootstrap a company uh, from working on an open source project and, and make make it successful without taking uh, VC investment. Um, so today we're talking about uh, the reinvention of the Eclipse Foundation, and I'm joined by Stephen Wally, who will be our guest host for the day, and Mike Malinkovich, the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation. And we're going to talk about some of the things that uh, the Eclipse Foundation has seen in its lifetime, where where it's gone from. Uh, a focus very much on the Eclipse IDE to to where it is today, and I, I don't want to steal any of the thunder of of, uh, of Stephen and Mike. So I will, uh, uh, Stephen, would you like to uh, tee up the session and, and get us going, please? Certainly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Wally. I work for Microsoft at this point in history in the Azure office of the CTO, and I was really happy to invite Mike here. I had the pleasure and privilege of listening to Mike a few years ago talking about the long history of the Eclipse Foundation and, and his role in it. And I just thought that as the Eclipse Foundation continues to invent itself, that he'd make a great guest uh, on this video cast to help folks understand kind of where where the, where the Eclipse Foundation's come from and where it's going now. Mike, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, so Mike Blinkovich, uh, based in Ottawa, Canada, and uh, I've had a pretty interesting career um, in sort of straddling the line between business and technology. That's always been my my passion. Um, and I've had purely technical jobs. I was a hardcore developer for quite, for quite a few years. And I've had purely business jobs. I was actually an accountant for a couple of years. Um, and uh, and uh, I came to the realization that I'd rather make beans than count them. So that's why I got out of that gig. Um, I went back to school and got a, a master's in, in information sciences and uh, then uh, worked at uh, places like big companies like Bell Northern Research slash Nortel, um, IBM, um, Oracle. And I worked for a number of startups uh, here in Ottawa, Object Technology International, um, the Object People and uh, a Santa Clara based startup called WebGain. Um, so I've sort of done a lot of entrepreneurship and, and a lot of big company stuff as well. But then I've been doing this job at the Eclipse Foundation now for 16 years. Um, and I can promise you that when I started this job, I did not have any intention of staying in it for this long. Um, but the job keeps changing around me and um, keeps me fascinated. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's why I keep doing it. And that that's fabulous because I, I've only ever known you as you know, Mike Malinkovich, who works at the Eclipse Foundation. That was, I think, literally since it started, uh, even kind of as the project was rolling into the, the foundation. Um, that talk you gave a, a few years ago now, it, you kind of teed it up as there was, you'd been through three phases. You know, there was that initial phase where everything was fantastic as, as the foundation grew around the IDE. And then we, we hit 2008 and the economic crisis. And then there was a number of dark years where, where things weren't so fabulous. And then things started to turn around again, and you you started you brought the Eclipse Foundation into new and interesting places. And I remember that was kind of the rise of a lot of IoT projects and, and such. So w walk us through that a little bit, uh, please. Yeah, sure. So the um, so the the talk you're you're referring to was something I gave at the at that time. It was called the Open Source Leadership Summit. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was it was talking about the um, I called it the foundation hype cycle. And uh, and and to be honest, it was a bit of a it was meant to be sort of a, a little bit of a dig at the at the propensity of the Linux Foundation to spin up more and more and more foundations. Um, and uh, and it, and basically, I, I ripped off the Gartner hype cycle, uh, and I talked about the in a, you know, the honeymoon phase, the hangover phase, and then renewal. Um, and uh, those were the three phases that you were just just talking about. And yeah, in the honeymoon phase. Um, it's it's really easy 
uh, when you have a open source foundation uh, that, ha that has a technology that everybody is super excited about um, and wants to participate and, and you have that sort of early burst of momentum. In 2008, it was sort of like a perfect storm. It was a mix of the, of course, the economic downturn um, and the corresponding loss of a loss of uh, members support that happened when you know companies were right. out of business. There was also a, a long phase of acquisitions that happened. Um, IBM literally acquired 40 of our members over a space of a number of years, like 40 of our members. Um, so, uh, which we can talk about a little bit in terms of the, the business side of open source. I mean, Absolutely. If, if you have a big player in an ecosystem, um, what's a better way to pick your acquisition targets than a tech, than, than a, than a startup that's already using the technology that, that, that is central to your business and just, you know, mow, mow through the ecosystem through acquisition and, and but at, you know, and, and admittedly at that point in time, um, IBM strategically was on a growth by acquisition kind of kind of approach. And then um, after we sort of suffered through the hangover phase, then we got into the renewal phase. And that's really, you know, where we started to branch out from it, it, We had been doing it for beforehand in terms of branching out into other technology areas, but being much more explicit about it and much more intentional about being an open source foundation that was an umbrella foundation, uh, that we were interested in multiple technologies, stepping out of our roots in Java and OSGI and, and into C and Python. And um, and as you mentioned, breaking into IoT. Um, and uh, now, and then, and then we can talk a little bit about this as we kind of went further along. More recently, we've now become a specification organization. Uh, and so we're we're now both doing open source and open specifications with the uh, the move of Java EE to Jakarta EE, uh, and so uh, and then of course uh, even more recently uh, our decision to um, redomicile as a European company and and become a a, a Belgian based nonprofit association. So let's let's talk about that right now. Uh, before we got going with this, you were talking about just the the numbers uh, in terms of membership and such that you had in Europe, and and what why is the Eclipse Foundation now hubbed out of out of Europe? So first of all, uh, we're not quite there yet. So uh, so th this is uh, so th this is a sorry for celebrating before your time. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean. I, I, I overuse this phrase, but this is a process, not an event. Uh, so, um, so first of all, so we've we've done all the filings, uh, but the way the things work in Belgium is, uh, you do your filing to be uh, recognized as a corporation and a nonprofit, and uh, the Ministry of Industry um, at some point then issues a royal decree that says that you are now and you are now in existence and and you are a nonprofit. Um, and and by the way, one of the reasons why we picked Belgium uh, was that once the royal decree is issued, you are you are recognized as a nonprofit from day one. Where in contrast, you know, if you're in the U.S. or if you're in uh, Germany, for example, you, you you incorporate, you start operating, then you file for nonprofit status, and some period of time later, the tax authorities get back to you and let you know whether they agree that you're a nonprofit. Okay, so you're kind of like you know flying without a net for a little while um, in 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 countries like U, uh, U.S. and Germany. So we're still waiting for our royal decree. Um, there's okay. been both the pandemic and uh, a change of government in Belgium is kind of slowing down the process. Uh, so, but we hope to uh, to get that soon. And so, but but even beyond that, I mean, um, once we get the royal decree, you know, we want to move all of our projects over. We want to move all of our members over. And you're not going to do that with the stroke of a pen or you know in an afternoon. There's there's a lot right. of it goes into it goes into the logistics of, of making those things happen. Uh, another thing that, we, that we've done is we've actually stood up another forge, uh, and so uh, we we our projects can be on GitHub. Our projects can be on our own forge, which is a sort of a Git plus Bugzilla plus Garrett. For a base forge, um, and we also just recently stood up a GitLab-based forge um, hosted on servers in Switzerland, 
And so that's uh, now a third option. So if you want to have your uh, project, you know, physically domiciled in in Europe, uh, we can we can help support that for you. Yeah. But I think it was the the numbers that uh, surprised me were just how many of your members yeah. big percentages. Yeah. So the so you know how did we make this decision? Um, so it all started with a a, a board meeting last October uh, where. One of our uh, board representatives happened to be from Europe. Um, uh, said, you know, hey, it seems like the Clips Foundation is doing quite well in Europe. Why don't you go off and study, you know, and analyze what's working well in Europe, where you are in Europe, and how we could do even better in Europe? And so, when we actually ran the numbers, um, it turns out that somewhere between two thirds and seventy percent of our members were based in Europe. And same uh, same proportion of committers, uh, developers who work on our projects, were also based in Europe, and one third of our headcount was based in Europe. So, by all of the measures that we could find, uh, we already were the the first of all, we already basically were European, and we already were the largest open source foundation in Europe. Uh, and so then we kind of poked at it a little bit more, and we saw that there's a number of European initiatives. Um, strategic initiatives like digital sovereignty, citizen privacy, ethical artificial intelligence, all of these things um, that are being, you know, supported from the center, um, uh, you know, from the European Commission in Europe, uh, that uh, where open source was going to be at the core of these strategies. Right. And so we decided that, um, and, and, and sorry, and we came to the conclusion, and this is sort of like, sort of like, skating to where the puck is, um, is going to be, uh, we decided that the European Commission was going to eventually reach the conclusion that they needed an open source foundation in Europe if they were going to actually be able to execute on these strategies. Uh, so first of all, you know, so we decided that we wanted to take that, you know, seize that opportunity, be, be that foundation. Uh, and so that's, that was a big part of the, uh, the reason why we um, decided to redomicile at Brussels. Well, and it just seems to make so much sense, especially based on how how rich your member base already was, and the fact that a third of your staff was there. That, that's that's got to make it a little bit easier. Uh, I, again, so so what kinds of initiatives um, are, have you already started to touch, or are you hoping to be directly involved in? Yeah, so there's uh, so pretty much all the things I just touched on. So okay. uh, when it, when it comes to uh, AI. Uh, so there's a, a large, large European research initiative called um, AI for EU, um, and we're talking to them about being sort of their partner in open source. Uh, within the topic of digital sovereignty, there's uh, the Gaia X initiative that was right. first started in Germany, but is now becoming a pan-European initiative. They're actually also in exactly the same state that we are, where they have filed for incorporation in Brussels and are waiting for their for their royal decree to become a official uh, an official entity. Um, and we're talking to them also about um, how we can help support them both for open source and open specifications, because uh, both of those are going to be part of the Gaia X initiative, and that's all around digital sovereignty about um, specifying and building a federated cloud infrastructure. Um, so that it would even be possible for um, other uh, organizations, other than the hyperscalers, to be able to uh, to provide uh, meaningful cloud services, uh, right. based in Europe. Uh, and so, um, and then the uh, the other one around uh, uh, you know data privacy, citizen privacy. We're involved in a uh, in a European research project uh, that we're um, we're actually helping doing research around building tools for helping protect uh, protect data privacy. So that one's actually um, ongoing uh, even before we made the, the, the move to Europe. And one of the things that we've been doing, for, we've, we've been, uh, we've had a legal entity, uh, Eclipse Foundation Europe, GmbH, uh, in Europe for right. seven or eight years. And a big part of the reason why that organized, why that entity exists will place, well, one, to employ our um, staff in Europe, but also uh, to engage in these uh, European research projects under um, programs like Horizon 2020 and the like. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think it's it's been great to watch this. I, I think it's exciting. I mean, I'm, when do you get to move to Brussels? 
<laughs> uh, I'm not planning on moving to Brussels, um, okay. but I, uh, and so, uh, you know, the two thirds of our staff that is, uh, that is currently sitting in mostly in Ottawa, uh, Canada are going to stay where they are. There's too much, you know, institutional memory and, and so on there to, to mess with that. But we are very much focused on growing our headcount in Europe. Uh, and I would not be at all surprised, um, you know, uh, that my, my eventual successor is based in Europe. Uh, and so definitely going to be, um, you know, this is not just sort of like paper. Uh, we, 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 we mean, right. we're, this is, this is a meaningful move. Uh, and we do expect to, uh, to focus our growth in Europe. No, I, I, I think it's, it is genuinely exciting to see what, what's going on because there has been that kind of American centric uh you know all all of the c3s and c5 uh, c6s like we talk about them as c3s and c6s without kind of casually understanding that that's us irs tax law designations kind of thing that uh you know you occasionally hear that uh, so, some of those european countries have different designations too but you yeah. never hear about any of these foundations or nonprofits in that context and, and we do think that this is going to be an interesting differentiator for us. Um, you know, absolutely. The, you know, a lot of the other big open source foundations, you know, the Linux Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, Mozilla Foundation. Not only not only are they U.S. based, they are all California based, Silicon Valley based, right? And so, um, having a, a large, um, relevant uh, open source foundation. That is based in Europe with a, um, uh, I think, really makes us different. And I can tell you that we were already having conversations that we wouldn't have been having, you know, six months ago. Right. And where people are like, "Yeah, that's really interesting. Tell me more. Um, you know, tell me uh, how I can move my um, uh, move my project to uh, to the Eclipse Foundation and, and be based in Europe." And I think it's also important to understand that. I mean, um, open source is becoming a global supply chain. Right. There's this underneath right. huge amount of the innovation that's happening around the world and in pretty much every sector of industry you can imagine. There's this open source pipe of enabling technology that is helping support all of this innovation. And um, and th that global nature, uh, I think it makes a the idea of having a an open source foundation with the European legal framework um, based in Europe with infrastructure in Europe, um, interesting from a global perspective. Very much so. So, so the specification work that, that intrigues me. I mean, there, there was a point at least a dozen years ago, maybe earlier when, when you and Ian asked me to take a look at that for you when I was a lone consultant out there and, and it was, I'm sure that got long lost, but, but it's back now. <laughs> um, so, and, and when you look at it, it's, it seems to be the, the pipeline's going both ways. Um, we're seeing Oasis step into the space of doing open source. We're seeing the IEEE Standards Association working to figure out how to support open source projects. And then you see the Linux Foundation, uh, you know, with the absorbing of, absorbing of the Joint Development Foundation starting to step into the specification work. What was it that, that brought the Eclipse Foundation into this space? So we've been, thinking about, you know, as, as we talked with you years ago, I mean, we'd been thinking about this for a while, but it was really a, the, the, the tangible opportunity of moving Java EE out of um, Oracle and the Java community process that really, you know, motivate us to do all of the work. Uh, because setting up a specification process is not for the faint of heart. Um, you know, I, I, I I can remember when we started off the process of creating what became the Eclipse Foundation specification process and and moving Java EE over to Jakarta EE. Um, Dan Bandera from IBM said, "You know, Mike, this is going to take a year," and I was I was pretty sure that you know we could definitely we knew what we were doing and we could definitely get it done in less than a year. And he was he was spot on. It. It uh, by the time you get everybody's lawyers involved and review all the documentation and build all the documentation and so on, it it was a year's worth of effort to to create um, uh, the specification process. But I'm really happy with that with where we ended up. Like what we have built, um, I think, is a modern, open, royalty-free 
specification process um, that uh, fully meets. I mean, I was on the board of the OSI for six years, and, and it's they're famous for their open source definition, but they also have an open standards definition um, that Perfect. gets less uh, less uh, less air uh, air time. And our process, you know, you know I, I consciously made sure that we that we met all of the requirements of the open standards definition as well. Uh, and uh, so that the things that we build at the Eclipse Foundation in the specification world can be freely used by anybody um, and, and without ever talking to us, without ever signing a membership agreement, they can build to our specifications and they can claim compliance with our specifications and get the patent grants and so on um, that are that are embodied in, in the specifications. And, and I think that was uh, that's something that we're actually pretty proud about. I think we we think we did we did a pretty darn good job. Excellent. So, are you going to take that next step as well and become an ISO public uh, available spec submitter? <laughs> I, uh, it's not that we're we wouldn't mind it. Uh, we we need a, I think we need a, a tangible use case to drive it. Right. Um, again, these kinds of processes are not something you do on a lark. Um, okay. You have to have motive. You have to be properly motivated. Um, and uh, at, at least at this moment, I wouldn't say we've got the the proper motivation. Um, well, there's there's also that I, there's the learning curve that I've seen multiple times now, where engineers that are used to collaborating on open source software projects assume that collaborating on specifications is the same thing, and they think, oh, this will be this will be great. We'll be able to bang a spec out in no time. And there's an interesting an industry momentum that's just different when you do standards because there's product cycles involved <laughs> and you can't just trivially move a spec to its next and break backwards ca compatibility the way you sometimes can with a so uh, software project and there's there's just a couple of there's there's a real rhythm there that I remember when the, the engineers first finished the first OCI specification around containers like they'd They'd done it. It took them two years to get it over the finish line. They were exhausted. It was like, oh my god, I never want to do this again. And and I laughed because I was thinking, two years for a spec, that's pretty fast, kind of thing. Oh, yeah, but so the reverse is it'll be interesting true, to see. Right? That. Yeah, getting the, the cycles is also true. I mean, how many times have you seen people who th who come from an open specification background? Who think that they understand how open source will work? Absolutely, they understand how open collaboration works. Turns out, no, not really. It's a completely different. It's a, it, you're. I mean, it, you're right. It is a completely different um, kettle of fish. But one of the things that's in baked into our specification process is that you cannot declare a spec final until you also have a compatible implementation in open source. Right. right. So, um, so uh, we 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 call it a code first specification process, and and what we mean by that is we only want to take on specifications where um, they're they that are demonst have demonstrated interest from industry, that there is uh, and by demonstrated interest in industry, I mean there are um, e you know existence proofs out there of working code. Um, in this domain uh, that we can use as a motivator for building a specification. And, uh, and, and, and that's a little bit of a different take from some things, but we do think that uh, one of the successes of the, in, that comes out of the Java world is the idea of having a spec plus an implementation plus a TCK, that sort of triumvirate of artifacts um, right. gets you to a better outcome than than just a spec by itself yeah now this is it's exciting it's an exciting time for the nonprofits in this space that uh so when you were talking about i i had no idea that you'd had that many members gobbled up by another member um the last time i i, I remember the first the first time i ever saw something like that um the Open Systems Foundation, way back in the early '90s, they it was seven large OEMs, eight large OEMs that started that process. But over the next five years, you know, four of them bought three of them, and that was back when they were the the big check writers. So this wasn't little fish being oh, yeah. gobbled up. This was big fish being eaten, and and that suddenly had this kind of 
surprising effect on their budgets. But the, yeah, the idea that you, you lost 40 members, again, that must have been a surprising effect on the budget. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it was also, and don't forget, then industry consolidation is a thing, right? I mean, so right. if, if we look at the, you know, at the board level, like, so the, the strategic members that are paying $250,000 and now euros, uh, you know, um, Intel bought Wind River, SAP bought Sybase. I mean, so there's, um, there's, there's big, uh, um, Oracle bought BEA. I mean, there's like there's some big big hits at the at the budget level that happens from the, that kind of industry consolidation, um, and that's um, uh, but that's something that is recognized by all membership supported nonprofits these days. That um, you're always at the uh, um, you're always exposed to acquisitions amongst your membership. I mean, we happen to have a particularly hard time of it back in in those days, but it's 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 definitely a thing. Right. Well, and I think part of it, though, it's if you're one of those small startups, I think it's equally interesting from their perspective that I, I'm the uh, board chair for the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium, which is a year old now. It's it's one of the Linux Foundation directed funds. But I think it was fascinating when you watch the dynamic around uh, when we, we we were still meeting in person and you'd see our small members, they'd have that opportunity to talk to the big anchoring members in business relationships that they wouldn't have otherwise had except through the nonprofit. Yep. But that was the, the channel for them to, to partner with folks and potentially open those deals. So I, I have to assume that the annual that the annual eclipse meetings, that there was a lot of side meetings. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, at our conferences and so on. Um, and I think, but I think that that ultimately sort of is part of the success of the Eclipse Foundation in particular, but many open source foundations. You know, one of the things that's unique about the way that we're set up is that our bylaws, like right in the very first paragraph in, in our purposes statement, um, our purpose is both, it's, it's a dual purpose. It's both to foster our open source projects and their communities and to foster a commercially sustainable ecosystem. And uh, I, I know that that's actually, as far as I know, that's quite unique amongst open source foundations and something that's actually, I think, really um, put us in good stead. And, and some of the things that we do um, uh, that help that is, you know, uh, you know, in the world, the original world of the Eclipse IDE, for many years, we've supported the Eclipse marketplaces, which is where you go and get plugins and extensions for, uh, um, for the Eclipse IDE. Um, and so that we've been really nurturing the ecosystem there. Uh, we're in the process of doing something similar um, with uh, Eclipse Thea, which is um, our new generation of um, a, a new generation IDE platform that's based on JavaScript and TypeScript and, and uh, modern web technologies. Uh, we're building something called Open VSX Registry, which is a place where you can get VS Code extensions. Um, and install them in something other than VS Code because Microsoft's got a terms of use restrictions on their on their extensions on their, their extension registry that says you're only allowed to put this you're only allowed to install this in the VS Code um, and uh, so you know you know basically putting a um, preventing uh, a competing IDE like Eclipse Thea um, from participating there so. Uh, again, trying to spur the ecosystem growth around around Eclipse Thea and and its uh, and its partner Eclipse Che, um, which are, are like I said, our, our new uh, next generation IDE platforms. Well, and that that was as you said, it was part of the kind of founding founding principles behind the Eclipse Foundation that it you you took action to build that marketplace. And so, what what sorts of things uh, you know were, were the were, other things beyond the marketplace, I guess, initially is the way I, way I want to ask it, that helped generate that kind of that ecosystem for successful businesses. Well, part, part of it is just um, being intentional, right? So, you know, when we talk to folks about open source projects and, and open source uh, in general, they find it very refreshing when we say things like, oh, yeah, we want you to make money. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, you know, you don't have to apologize for wanting to make money um, and, and coming up with a business model 
um, that, uh, that, uh, that, that works for you. I mean, you, you, you're famous for doing your talks that says there's no such thing as an open source business model. Um, but it's true that, so if we are, if we as an organization are meant to be helping the, the governance of the project so that uh, the production of software that in open source, which is then commercialized, um, you know, we want to help those companies and we regularly talk to them about, we've seen this work, we've seen that work. Right. Um, one of the things that we do that is very, also very intentional is we actually structure all of our governance documents so that at each tier of membership, small companies can participate as well as large companies. So for example, there, you know, it, it, or, or the counter example is there are certainly open source foundations out there that simply says, if you want to be a platinum member and be on our board, you, the price is 300,000. Right. Which means that of course, that any of the smaller companies that might want to participate at that level of governance can't because they can't afford it. Right. So we structure our dues in all places uh, at, in all scenarios for, to enable exactly that. And that's actually been in many ways made our governance significantly better, right? Having that, uh, diversity of opinions around the table that comes from small companies uh, as opposed to large companies. I mean, you, you, with your background in both open source and open specifications, you know how that changes the conversation. Absolutely. Well, and and it's it's again, it's fun to even see it now uh, within the, the, the in the small around the cons, uh, the consortium that I'm I'm playing with right now because it is that interaction of the businesses. But I think I think. The fact that you said that you were intentional, um, and and that you took those steps, you that was wired into the way you talk to your members. I think is is just a, a, a real differentiation because starting probably with OpenStack, we started to see kind of enormous excitement in in a business world, but there wasn't. A structure for the business conversation. It was kind of like get everybody in a room together. An ecosystem will happen. Seemed to be the entire plan, and you know, so it, it was one of those things where I think just even those early steps of having the marketplace within the Eclipse Foundation has a way that it, it was this clear connection for the members to be doing things through the marketplace. It was, yeah. it was a really interesting way to tackle that discussion. And um, there's a it's, do you there's a question. There's a question on the chat that I think I would be good to answer, which is what are some of the ways the Eclipse Foundation has intentionally fostered a business ecosystem? And um, so let's, so the, the, the best answer I've got at the, the best example I can give you at the moment is, is the simultaneous release that we've been doing for something like 14 years um, for the IDE platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, there's two ways, there's two ways that that explicitly supports our business ecosystem that grew up around the IDE. The first is, is by having completely predictable schedules, everybody could build their product plans um, on the certainty that the software was actually going to arrive when we said it was going to arrive. So it was a very explicit, make it easier for adopters um, by providing them everything they needed with, a, with, a, with all the version management things resolved because they're all shipping on the same day, um, that that made it, uh, that, that helped our adopters. The second part that the simultaneous release uh, served in terms of spurring a business ecosystem is it became a channel. Um, and so what, what I mean by that is our, our IDE is downloaded by millions of developers. Right. So if you wanna get your technology adopted by you know something on the order of a couple of million C, C and C++ developers, primarily in embedded in real time um, and you know, even more millions of Java developers, you know, if you want to get your technology out to those kinds of developers, the easiest way to do it is come join us, put a project into Eclipse and become and get that project into the simultaneous release and get it downloaded onto those millions of desktops. And so, um, and that again, it was explicitly done to help foster a business ecosystem around, um, around the, the projects that we were hosting at the Eclipse Foundation. So it was about adoption and being a channel. So you you actually ran the platform game. I mean, when I when I talk about the platform game, I talk about it in a very Microsoft centric, multi sided market kind of way. I mean, all the way back to DOS and Windows, but up, up through the 
up through the generations of Microsoft technology, they've been running the multi-sided market of make sure you're, you're bringing in enough customers to attract the business people and bring in enough ISVs to attract the customers. And it, you know, and you take your cut off the bottom, so to speak. Whereas you've done that same platform play for all of your members, with you know, and that's provided that that kind of marketplace for them. It's it wasn't simply a hey, here's a, a plug-in marketplace. You were actually providing that platform that made that ma marketplace work. Yep, and I, I think that's a real differentiator there. That it, it, and we're as of this moment. Um, doing, trying to recreate that success story in our IoT space. Um, so we have now an IoT platform project that is shipping Helm charts for a bunch of our projects that are that basically provide you an out of the box IoT cloud infrastructure for for building IO, you know, highly scalable um, IoT systems. And so um, that that's a that's a you know a, again exactly the same kind of motivation. How, creating that two-sided marketplace that good platform and ecosystem strategies give you um, by helping f foster adoption and providing a channel for the technologies um, that then um, people and our members can commercialize. Yeah, because I think that the the easy contrast is well, li Linux is always a, a special case of everything, uh, just in the way that it grew, even with the OSDL into the Linux Foundation, but when you look at Kubernetes as the anchoring project in the CNCF, the intention isn't to build the platform so much as here's all the pieces. How they get assembled by you as a as a member or an, or an outside vendor is is your business kind of thing. But it, it's the the sum assembly required is left to the to the members. Yeah. So yeah. So the projects at the Eclipse Foundation that have been, I would say, the most the most successful. Um, we've been both the open source steward and the distro, uh, right? Right. So we're you know, and so we're 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 effectively the platform vendor in that ecosystem architecture. Yeah, very much so. That that's uh, so. You you said you've started to recreate it in IoT as well. Yep. Um, so what what are the other big areas? Uh, you know, there was the IDE, uh, and then there was a collection of Java projects uh, and IoT. Is that kind of the big centers now, or are there other centers of gravity within the Eclipse Foundation? So we have 375 projects at the Eclipse Foundation now. Um, and one of the things that my colleagues get sick of hearing me say is, if you focus on 375 things, you're focusing on nothing. Um, so we yeah. we talk about having four main pillars um, at the Eclipse Foundation. Um, so the first is cloud native Java, um, and we talked a little bit already about Jakarta EE, and and there's also another specification um, group at the Eclipse Foundation called MicroProfile, which is building defining vendor neutral specifications for building microservices in Java. And then we have a whole collection of open source projects like Jetty, Eclipse Glassfish, um, Vertex, you know projects that a lot of Java developers will instantly recognize, but might go, oh, wait, that's at Eclipse. Um, and uh, so, the, so, the, so cloud native Java is the first pillar. The second pillar is IoT and Edge. Um, and so we, we've talked a bit about IoT, but we haven't really talked about, um, we also have another working group called Edge Native um, Working Group. Okay. And there's a couple of really cool projects in there for um, building um, edge, uh, edge solutions. And in particular, um, Eclipse IO Fog um, is, we think, the most complete open source technology out there for building um, an edge computing network today. Uh, and it comes from, um, it, you know, runs on uh, runs on top of Linux, uses containers, um, and provides an infrastructure for building, deploying, and managing um, an edge infrastructure as an extension of your existing Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, which I think is pretty cool. And then there's also um, Eclipse Fog OS that comes from more of a telecom background. So it talks about 5G and Mac and these kinds of things. Um, that's It's Python based um, and is um, is also a pretty cool platform that's just starting now to, to actually hook up to the Kubernetes ecosystem as well. So that's sort of, the, so IoT and Edge, oh, and actually, and, and Sparkplug. So there's a specification in there as well, um, which we think is really cool. So in there's a, a there's a protocol that's very popular in IoT called MQTT, um, and, uh, which is it's it's 
it's it's the HTTP of the Internet of Things, um, and um, but uh, MQTT doesn't specify the content. So basically, Sparkplug is the content definition for MQTT. It is the HTML um, for the industrial internet. Um, so what it defines is a set of topic structures, payload structures, and an application lifecycle model for having out of the box interoperability of industrial machinery, um, which is, I think, a pretty pretty cool problem to solve. Um, so then the third pillar um, is automotive and uh, but when we talk about automotive, we don't mean uh, like we're not competing competing with automotive grade Linux. We're not talking about software that's running in the car. We're talking about primarily two things, the connected car scenarios. So how do we take the technology of IoT and apply it to connected car scenarios? Okay, right. So Eclipse Cooksa, for example, that was a research project led, led by Bosch. Uh, basically has it runs on top of AGL in the car, but has a complete infrastructure um, for doing connected car scenarios, including an app store kind of scenario for how could you deliver and manage um, apps um, running in the in the dashboard of your car. Uh, and then second area in automotive is a lot of simulation. So uh, autonomous driving systems in particular um, need a ton of testing before they can be safety verified. And so we have a number of projects like uh, Eclipse Sumo, um, which is part of our open mobility working group and then um, open pass, which comes out of a peg, the Pegasus research project in Europe um, for doing um, simulation of driving scenarios to help uh, help uh, safety qualify uh, autonomous driving systems or advanced driving systems. And then the fourth pillar is um, our original franchise in tools. And I already touched on this a little bit in terms of in, in, in addition to the the venerable Eclipse desktop IDE platform, which has served the industry so well for um, almost 20 years. Almost 20 years now, yeah. Uh, we also have the um, the uh, a whole new uh, tooling platform based on Eclipse Thea and Eclipse Che um, that is really providing an open uh, vendor neutral tooling platform um, for, um, for the next generation of developers. And so uh, that's, um, so those are those are the four main things in terms of the whole span of the of the of the, uh, the the technology that we provide, and you have to remember like so when you say talk to developers and you, you we still run into this. I mean, Eclipse Nation has been in existence for sixteen and a half years, and I still regularly get asked if I work for IBM. It's just like you know, you know, pull your head out of the sand, buddy. Um, <laughs> you worked for a company that was acquired. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. A long time ago, uh, but, uh, and uh, so it's hard to change people's perceptions. Um, yeah. but, so we regularly still, you know, people think of the Eclipse Foundation as that's, you know, the only thing we do is the IDE, but uh, we have a very, very large portfolio of projects. I said, you know, 375, um, you know, one of which is a Java IDE. Um, so there's a lot more going on at the Eclipse Foundation than, uh, than that. Well, how big is the membership now in, in terms of just raw numbers? 325-ish. Okay. Yeah. And is, is it, I take it that's kind of the, the same kind of thing you see in a lot of other places, that an order of magnitude smaller for the number of kind of big ticket premier members with, you know, big dollars versus the rest of it. But Yeah, the, the, the core group at our board is there's, yeah, there's, uh, you know, you'd think I'd know this number right off the top of my head, but it's it's about a, it's about ten um, uh, strategic members um, that, of course, are some of which are smaller companies, uh, but in terms of the the larger companies that are you know, you know making up that make up a significant number of our um, uh, of our budget. There's you know, IBM, Oracle, Red Hat, SAP, Bosch, Fujitsu, and Huawei. Okay, uh, so those are the that's seven. Yeah. With that number of members, you're actually, you know, you, you, you've blown well past the number that, you know, what, what's the old number, about 150 people that you keep track of in your head kind of thing. You've, com you've comfortably doubled that <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, so, Dunbar's yeah. number, I think, right? You, you'd almost need to be in harness for, you know, 16 years just to remember who your members are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bless you. Sorry, we just had a question come in. There you go. 
what are the industry trends that you see most critical for the Eclipse Foundation over the next decade? I mean, there's a number of different technology trends that we could that we could touch on, but there's I think the one trend. So, the, the, so what it says is the most critical for Eclipse over the next decade, and I assume they mean the most critical for the Eclipse Foundation over the next decade. That's and, the way I was interpreting. It. Yeah, and I would say that uh, the mo I think the most important one is that um, you know we we regularly hear now that open source has won, um, and um, whatever that means, I'm not sure exactly what it won because I, I, I thought we we won you know 25 years ago before we called it open source, but apparently we're we're still winning. Yeah, we just so much winning, um, and uh, but I think there's a it's open source has won as the production mechanism of choice certainly for the group of companies uh, that are they think of themselves as technology companies. Um, so I'm thinking of the the cloud hyperscalers, you know the the system vendors. You know, open source is, is definitely become second nature for them. Uh, and 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 the, we could talk at length about the some of the cynical applications of of open source that uh, that large companies are capable of of, of doing as well. Um, but I think that the but open source open source may have won, but there is a huge percentage of the world's economy that um, comes from industrials and enterprises that are still trying to figure out what this open source has one thing means to them. Yeah. Um, and I think from, you know, what I, what I often say is that most companies and enterprises out there that you talk to talk, will say that they have a digitalization strategy or some kind of open innovation strategy. And they're, they're trying to, um, you know, change the way that they do business into something that's newer and more modern. They oftentimes can't say anything beyond sort of the buzzword bingo, um, but they, they at least, they at least say, say that they're trying. Um, and I think that the, the next, uh, but that, that group represents the next generation of win um, for open source, because I, I personally believe that when you talk about things like digitalization, ultimately, digitalization to me means that you are moving your enterprise to become a software centric organization. Um, you know, whatever it is that you think that you do for a living, whether it's banking or insurance or auto parts, um, it turns out that software is now the central way that you deliver value to your customers and, and, and innovation to your to your market and so you have to go you have to change your mindset to become a software centric organization and what we have learned from the software industry is that you cannot claim that you have mastered the art of software if you have not mastered the art of open source and so all of these uh, companies out there that are talking about you know digitalization um, you know, moving their um, innovation to be being more software centric. 100% of those companies have to learn how to master open source, and I think that's really um, the opportunity that's that's uh, driving uh, the Eclipse Foundation in terms of its growth and 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 where we're interested in in uh, seeing things evolve over the next decade. That's fabulous. So I have no other questions. You've taken, you've gone all the places I wanted you to go. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, especially I, I think the way the foundation is evolved, continues to evolve over this last ten years is is, is fantastic. Um, so, is there a big bash planned in two more years? You know, it's, it's yes. At at some point um, when travel is once again a thing, and yeah. and we can uh, safely uh, get within two meters of one another. Um, I, uh, I uh, look forward to hosting some one heck of a party at FOSDEM, for example. Uh, so, uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, and so looking forward to those, I'm looking forward to returning to some, um, greater degree of normalcy than what we have right now. Absolutely. Dave, are there other questions out there that you're holding back on us? Nope, I got mine in. Um, 
on the chat. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, joining us this week. And thank you, Stephen, for curating the session. Uh, I found it fascinating. I think that the evolution of the Eclipse Foundation from the original IDE to where it is today has been fascinating. And uh, it was great to hear more about it. Thank yeah. you so much. That, that was I, everything that I wanted you to say. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. So. Next week, we're taking a week off for Thanksgiving, US Thanksgiving, uh, to be precise. So we don't have any uh, session next week, but we will have on December 1st, uh, why I won't start a company around Envoy, um, which is how I pronounce Envoy. I don't know if people pronounce it Envoy, but anyway, I guess I'll find out from Matt Klein on December 1st how it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, so Matt Klein is the developer of the Envoy project, and he will be interviewed by uh, our co uh, content chair, Matt AC, uh, about some of the reasons why he's actually consciously chosen not to create a company around Envoy, around Service Mesh. Uh, yes, Service Mesh. Um, it's something that he's written about, and I find his his thought processes are fascinating. And it's one of the things that, uh, you know, again, those rarely uh, rarely explored aspects of the business of open source. Uh, the decision not to create a company is also something that uh, that can be a conscious and and uh, um, and correct decision around a project. You don't have to have a business just because you have a project. And we've seen that Envoy has been very successful with its support from Google and uh, Red Hat and other projects and its inclusion in in things like Istio. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And then to round off our first season, we will have. Uh, open Source Hardware, uh, a session with Alicia Gibb from the Open Source Hardware Association, uh, Limor Freed from Adafruit, and Jason Kridner, who is the co-founder of the BeagleBoard project. And we will be discussing the role that open source software development has as a complement to open, open hard, the open hardware community and developing business models around open source hardware. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that too. Uh, thank you both for your participation today, and I will uh, look forward to seeing you again in the near future. But Great. not unfortunately <laughs> this February in Brussels. Right. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> Take care, folks. Thank you. Bye.